I attended a um, I attended a uh, seminar for continuing education a few months, a few weeks ago. And as is normal, my custom when lunch break comes, I usually go to my truck and get my pipe and just walk wherever the seminar is kept. Just walk. You know. I was walking around the parking lot and I looked down and this was uh, a very active place. It wasn't you know, some log cabin out in the woods. And uh, there was a penny left on the ground. Now this was a restaurant type thing. Nobody bothered with this. So I picked it up. It was old and worn. I thought, how interesting that I should just happen upon this. My eyes lift up at, across the street at this restaurant. There was a huge, beautiful golf course. Of course, nobody out there. It's winter time. And a dirt road. So I started walking down the dirt road. About halfway down the dirt road, nobody around me, I looked casually to the right, and I saw two areas that were fenced off for vineyards. And I was given a mind to stop and just look at these vineyards. John chapter 15, Jesus says, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch can now, cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you, except ye abide in me. I am the vine ye are the branches he that abides in me and I in him the same brings forth much fruit for without me you can do nothing as I stood there looking at this vineyard and the bleakness of the day I began to notice some things and I became very hopeful and very comforted in what I was looking at first thing I noticed was the vineyard had a fence around it so that curiosity seekers like myself couldn't wander into the path. This vineyard was protected. No animals of a large nature could get in there to disturb the vine. No strangers could wander in. But it showed me that somebody had taken the time and the precaution and the love to put a fence around this. To keep out harm and destruction from the vine. Solomon said in the Song of Solomon, My beloved is an enclosed garden. There's a wall of protection. I noticed that there was a specific type of love here. I couldn't see any leaves, couldn't see any grapes hanging from any bunches. But I noticed that with very meticulous precision in a non-destructive manner the branches that came up out of the ground were tied to an arbor directing them causing them to go a specific way none were sticking out of the sides growing on their own at their own free will none had exceeded the height of the arbor 
but somebody had taken and tied with looked like cloth no wires no rope very lovingly tied those branches onto the arbor I couldn't see any fruit but I knew there had to be life for why would somebody take this time to care so meticulously for this area for this vineyard not large except that they knew that there was life there and they knew that there would be fruit and they knew that what they were doing was necessary to bring forth the fruit at its appropriate time I was there in the middle of winter I couldn't see the fruit but I knew that there was life there I looked down the row and I saw at specific intervals out of the ground came up the main trunk and although I looked at the ground and I couldn't see it I knew there was a root underneath of there I saw the vine coming up out of the ground and common sense tells me that if that is not connected to the root there's no life if there's no life then this care that has been taken to discipline and restrain appropriate appropriate a place and a direction for the branches would be useless but there it was several locations at specific intervals looked to be very accurately equally spaced apart the vine came up and began up the trellis some were halfway up the trellis some had matured to be all the way up and their branches had spread out each one in a different state and I noticed there were no dead branches I looked on the ground and I saw there were piles of branches that had no longer brought forth fruit, forth fruit and I noticed that some of those branches were they looked pretty good you know, they weren't all brown and dry but I knew that somebody knew that by pruning those branches back it would produce the crop that he desired everything this person was doing in this little area was for the purpose of getting what he intended he wasn't in there picking strawberries he didn't go in there to pick apples he specifically attended to this root in such a way that it made a manifestation in a specific place in a specific style and was treated in such a way to bring forth the specific fruit that was needed I looked and there was a there was one spot between the intervals of the root coming out of the ground and there were just two small shoots and I thought to myself well I guess that's where two or three are gathered together still connected to the root still had life in it but it was so young so tender and I thought it won't be long before they reach the lower portion of the trestle and the caretaker, the husbandman, would begin to tie them so that they didn't go astray, so that they grew straight. May not see fruit for a couple of years, but there's life there. And everything that is being done is for the purpose of obtaining the fruit, the desired fruit. I saw a lot of animals, birds, around there, as it were, cleaning up around the vines. They were snatching up bugs, 
worms flying off. And I thought, how interesting it is that these creatures of nature were brought to this area. They weren't out on the golf course. But they were sent to clean that area. You know, he calls the ravenous bird from the east. Well, the ravenous bird eats the meat. And if he calls the ravenous bird and there's no meat, the ravenous bird dies. But he said, I call the ravenous bird from the east. I call those birds. I put them in the vineyard. The vineyard is cleaned by them. Now, Scripture tells us who the fowl of the air are. But they are subservient. They come and they perform a service there. They cannot harm the vine. They can't dig down to get the root. And all that the farmer has done in cutting around, cutting away these branches the year before, pruning the ones to bring forth more fruit, taking away the ones that have finished bearing the fruit, there they are laying on the ground and the fowl of the air are tending to cleaning it up. I saw one came up out of the ground and looked all so lonely because it just came up and it stopped. There was nothing branching off of it. It looked to be so solitary. Right next to it there was a very large vine coming out of the ground many branches coming off. I looked at the contrast and I thought to myself this one will be bringing forth much fruit next year but this one probably won't. And I thought in my arrogance how have I evaluated this? I've evaluated it on the potential of product the merchandise the gain. But the truth of the matter is they were both connected to that same root. They had the same life. They were of the same quality because the same man who tied up all these branches for this one had carefully tied this one. So it grew exactly the way he intended that it should grow. The area was cleared. There weren't any other trees. There weren't any thorns. There weren't any briars. Somebody had prepared that area. Here was this beautiful demonstration of a vine that was bringing forth what was expected, what was desired, and whoever was tending to it was so carefully attentive to it to make it go the way it should go. Such attention to detail. I thought I thought that this gentleman must have stood out there for hours in the late fall or whenever the season was done, taking these little strands and tying up these branches, being sure not to hurt them, to snap them or to cause any damage to them. I thought to myself, that man had a lot of patience to sit there and do that. I wondered if I could do it. But I, as I observed this vineyard, I noticed several rows, each one of them coming from the same root. And there was a plaque on the front saying what kind of grape it was going to be produced, for what purpose for what wine and I thought to myself I can't see that root but I know that that root is going to produce the same grape on this one that's all the way in the front corner and that one that's all the way in the back corner they are the same fruit and it's not like he's out there every year wondering what kind of fruit was going to produce he knew he had planted the vine, I mean the root. He had pruned it. He had nurtured it. He was the husbandman. He did the work so that the vine would grow, the branches would grow, the grapes would come forth, and he would gra- uh, collect the harvest of his intention. Nothing left to chance. Jesus said, I am the true vine. 
As I stopped viewing this one, I stepped back and I started walking up the street, and there was another one. It had lost my, it had escaped my attention the first time I walked down the road. And I looked and I said, they look identical. They both were fenced in. They both were carefully attended to. But this one brought forth a certain type of grape. And that one brought forth a completely different type of grape. To the untrained eye, they looked identical. I couldn't tell them apart. In Isaiah chapter 5, he says, Let me sing you the song of my well-beloved. My well-beloved had a vineyard. He cleared the ground. He dug it, planted the root of his choice, fenced it in, put the tower, put the wine press, and intended that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. I don't know what a tame grape is and what a wild grape is, but it's certain that the husbandman knew. He didn't mistake in it. He didn't have to take it and send it out to an evaluator to tell me what it was. He knew. He knew right away. Interesting. He planted the vine of his choice. He didn't plant a vine and look at it and say, how did these wild grapes get here? He planted that vine. And the wild grapes came forth from that vine. Now I'm standing looking at this, these two vineyards, and I can't see a difference. And I thought to myself, I don't know which is wheat and which is tare. I don't know which is sheep and which is goats. I don't know which is sweet wine. I don't know which is dry wine. I don't know. Because I couldn't tell after the natural man. I could not make a judgment about these vines. They had both been treated identical but Jesus said I'm the true vine one of these two and of course I speak in nature one of these two was for the purpose of this wine that's what the plaque said on the front I cheated I read that's what the plaque said this was for this wine this was for this wine if I took from this vineyard over here attempting to make this wine over here it wouldn't work that's common sense that's nature and I thought to myself, this is incredible that I should be here looking at this and realizing that there is a true vine for the purpose that it was intended. The vine that was put in the ground that brought forth wild grapes was put there for that purpose. And as he says in Isaiah chapter 5, what more could I have done? I planted the vine of my choice. It brought forth wild grapes. It doesn't matter that I have put a fence around it, that I have carefully pruned, that I have carefully tied up and disciplined this. He did this all, and it brought forth exactly what it was supposed to bring forth. There was no mistake. The husbandman had spent all the time preparing this vineyard in Isaiah chapter 5, and it brought exactly what it was by nature. He spent the same amount of time upon this other vine, which was the true vine, and what did it bring forth? It brought forth what it was of nature. It could bring forth no other. There is a vineyard. There is an attention to that vineyard. There is a meticulous intention attention to that vineyard and Jesus said I am the vine you are the branches so what does that mean if I am a child of grace born from above is it an admonition for me to abide in him I didn't see any branches in either one of those vineyards walking around asking if they could have a ride on one of the branches on the vine they had no choice in the matter. Those of the one that was on the left, if they weren't cut off because they were pruned or because they brought forth no more grapes, had no choice of abiding. 
in the vine, they were cut off, they were done. Those that were there indeed had to abide in the vine or they would bring forth no fruit. I didn't see the man tying up any dead branches. It wasn't strewn with lights and stuff to make it look pretty as he had death all over the place. The husbandman knew that this branch connected to this vine, which connected to that root, and therefore there was life in there. And that in the appointed time, in nature we say probably around late summer, they would bring forth the fruit. I could see no fruit. I couldn't see any evidence of any fruit. I didn't see any little buds. Probably if I had looked closer I could have, but I couldn't see anything. How did I judge that? I judged it in nature according to what I perceived had been done by a very wise and a very caring individual. Our world tells us in the religion of Adam we must see evidence. Bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. That's what John said. And the Pharisees couldn't do it. And all of the self-help books and the philosophies and theologies of Adam want to see evidence. Bring forth evidence. What evidence was there in these two vineyards that I was observing other than the fact that someone had done something to the vineyard which indicated there was life there? I couldn't see the fruit. I probably could have gone and purchased a bottle of last year's wine that was made from, but I couldn't see any fruit there. Did I judge it as having no fruit? Did I judge it as a wild or a uh, good vine? It had a vine. It was a vine for its purpose. Each one of them had been attended to, and I could say that looking at that, I knew that the person that spent the time gave all he could to making this exactly what he intended. There were no vines coming up the outside perimeter fences. There was a barrier. There was a protective barrier that kept me, the gainsayer, from getting in there and looking at it, touching it, handling it, damaging it in my ignorance. God said about his people, he said, Jerusalem, your walls are ever before me. There's not a thing I can do but see the walls. What are the walls? In Zechariah, he said Jehovah himself was a wall of fire around his people, around his city. He said those walls were salvation, deliverance. He said those walls were there to keep others out. For everyone who loves and makes a lie is outside the wall. They're outside the fire. They can't get in. They can't touch the dogs, the whoremongers, the adulterers. They are outside. They cannot touch the vineyard of God. They can't even approach to it. If I was to point, uh, paint the picture in my mind and I see this city, this magnificent city, set upon the hill in all its brilliance and glory, my attention is drawn to it, and I see that there is a magnificent, bright, shiny, glittering wall made of living, lively stones. But there's a ring of fire around it that I can't get to it. For fear of the natural man, I wouldn't even attempt to go through that fire. And that fire is the protection that God has placed around the wall of his city. He has taken each one of his children, born from above, born of that same root, made them manifest in their appointed place at their appointed time they grow at the appointed rate that they should grow obviously obviously, looking at the vineyard that I saw I saw that there were some that were thick and well matured multiple branches being tied up and there were some that were like those two little shoots that I saw coming out of the ground they all have their appointed time they have their appointed manifestation. They have their appointed acquaintance. Like I said, there was only two coming out, two little branches sticking out. I thought, how lonely those two little things are. How they might be looking up at these mighty ones that are above them and saying, oh, I hope I get to be like that. I know that's fictitious, but still, the point is, 
these two little shoots coming out, just starting out, how long of a life did they have? What fruit should they bring forth? I couldn't tell. If our Father in Heaven is the husbandman, He makes us manifest in our time. We can look at that in two ways. We can say that according to Acts uh, 17, He said, He has made men, all men of one blood and has set the time of their habitation and the limitations there. And we know that the time of my habitation, if I am a child of grace, the time of my habitation expressly is expressly coordinated with the fruit that I should bring forth. Because when I am finished bringing forth fruit, he will take me away. So the time of my habitation, the limitations thereof, are commensurate to the growth, maturity, discipline, to bring forth fruit, the exact amount of fruit, so that at the time that my fruit is finished, he will take me away. Now with that comes the manifestation of the fruit. I looked and I saw these two little branches coming out, or these two little shoots coming out of the ground. No one would expect to break it to uh, take a full bunch of grapes off of these little two. They would be observed, but there was no expectation. I looked at the other one, big trunk twisting around the arbor, carefully laid out so that the vines, lower vines were on the lower arbors. Everything was perfectly laid forth. There was an expectation there that there was going to be a harvest coming from that vine. And when it pleased the Father, he revealed that. Just as Paul said in the Galatians, when it pleased the Father to reveal his Son in me, those two little ones that I looked at had life in them. There's no doubt about that. But there was a time set when that life would be revealed. To me, I could look at it and I could say, yes, there's life because there's two branches. But I don't know what the time of that habitation is. How long is it going to be? What are the limitations for it? What are the fruit that it will bring forth? One thing is for certain. If that branch abides in that vine, it's going to bring forth fruit. Don't know how much. Don't know what it is. Guaranteed, if you abide in me, if he that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. Now I can return to those vineyards in the summertime and stand and look at the two bunches of grapes. Yeah, one might be red or purple and one might be uh, green. and yeah, I, I could say, okay, I know there's a difference. But only the true master of that vineyard knows what the difference is. What the purpose was. So we have no choice here in the matter of whether we will abide in him any more than we have a choice of whether he abides in us. We don't ask to get into the vine. I saw no, dud, uh, no branches laying there begging and petitioning to get regained in their place in the vine. I saw nothing banging at the gate of the fenced area hoping to get in and become part of the vine. And you say, well, that's absurd. Well, that's exactly what Adam's doctrine wants to believe, that we have a right to have access to that. And if I beg God and I petition God and I pester him with my prayers, he'll make me a part of that and I'll be grafted into that vine. But we know that's not the case. He that is born from above is of the true vine. The true vine manifests in its appropriate time, in its appropriate place, those branches that should bring forth fruit. And if they abide in him, which is not arbitrary. If they come forth out of the ground, they abide in Him. They bring forth fruit. Adam wants to say to us, be sure you maintain good works. Be sure you keep after good things. Look to do good works. Show me your works. Adam wants to see fruit. Adam wants to see evidence. Adam is ignorant to the things of the Spirit. Adam wouldn't know the fruit if it was hanging in front of him. 
And what's the proof of that? The builders have rejected the cornerstone. They've said it's not worthy for my building. It has no place. You know, when I thought about that that whole reference there, I thought, okay, these guys said, okay, see this stone here, this doesn't fit here, so we'll just put it aside, maybe it'll fit someplace else. That's not what it means. It means that these stonemasons setting this foundation of that building looked at this rock and says it has no place here. It cannot be used. It is not part of the building. And they not only have put it aside, they have totally rejected it. So if Adam stands in front of the true vine, seeing the fruit hanging off of it, is Adam going to be drawn to it? No. To Adam it doesn't mean anything. Because what is the fruit? What is the fruit? It is the peaceable fruits of righteousness. God said, I looked and I saw that there was none that sought after righteousness. But that has changed because of our age of enlightenment, because of our doctrine, because of our theology, because of the churches we attend, because of the degrees we get in our, in our cemeteries. Seminaries, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, is, is this why now we seek after righteousness? Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. They hunger and thirst after righteousness because they want the food of the homeland. They desire to be back home in Zion. They desire to come back to the place from which they were born. They desire to come back to the Father's house. They want the fatted calf of the Father's house. That's what they hunger for. It's not because Adam wants to do good. Adam can do good all of his life and be no credit to God whatsoever because he has no righteousness. He is unrighteous. He is unclean. He is a worker of iniquity. These bring forth the exact amount of fruit. These branches that are connected to the true vine. The exact amount of fruit. The exact quality of fruit. You say, wait a minute, isn't it all the same? Well, yes, it is. It's all righteous. It is all righteous. It is pure. It is clean. It is holy. It is bright. But, he says, there is a specific amount of fruit you will bear. And there is a specific amount that they will bear because when he put that grain into the, to the ground that was prepared for it, some brought forth tenfold, some brought forth a hundredfold. But they didn't bring forth anything different. It was all the same. He planted wheat, he got wheat. He planted corn, he got corn. He planted a vineyard, he got grapes. I am the true vine. I know my people. My people abide in me. I abide in them. They are one with me. They are inseparably joined. They are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. I love my people as I love myself. I have loved myself with an eternal love because he is eternal he alone inhabits eternity he loves his people with an eternal love yea I have loved you with an eternal love there has never been a time when he has not had the love of his people there never, never will be a time when the love of his people will ever diminish and because of that love he has in the manifestation of this vine and the branches taken measures some that look severe chopping that branch off some that may be painful pruning that branch back for his purpose is there any praise in the branch? no when the branch is done bearing fruit he takes it away where's the praise in the branch? the praise is in the righteous fruit what is the evidence of the existence of the life in the vine? The fruit that hangs at the harvest. Now we could go to Galatians and look at the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, tenderness, mercy. These things against which there is no such law, there is no law, cannot be seen by Adam. Adam does not know what patience is. Amen to that? Adam is not patient. Adam is not loving. This is why Christ said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, 
if you have love, not if you love one another, if you have love one for another. And he didn't mean that you have some left over after you love the world, because he said, love not the world, neither the things of the world. He said, if you have love, which is the same as that sap that flows from that root up to the branch and out to the, to the fruit that hangs on it. You have it. You don't get it. Everybody knows that that branch is intended to bring forth fruit come harvest time because of what the, the husbandman has done for it and to it. Certainly there must be some intent there. There's something being done here. He said, I have loved you with an eternal love. And if you have that love, one for another, everybody's going to say, that branch is part of that vine, which is a part of that root. And it didn't matter which one I looked at as I stood there on the street at, uh, observing these two vineyards. It was the same. That vine was part of that root. I had no question in my mind if the vineyard on the right hand side when it went down into the ground traveled all the way over to the one on the left hand side so that it's a, they were cross sharing roots. There was no question in my mind. In the ignorance of my natural mind I could say that branch was a part of that vine which is a part of that root. And if you have love one for another the world knows that branch is part of that vine. People say today we have to try and be like Christ. If we are not like Christ, we are not part of the vine. If we are born from above, we are an intrinsic part, an identical part to the vine. Now as I step back and I look at that vineyard, as I said, some of the branches that came up are the vines that came up out of the ground were skinny. Some were big, been there a long time. Some were really tender, those two little ones. I don't know why those two little ones stuck in my mind, but you know, looking at them, I saw them and thought, wow, those two look so lonely. Just two little vines coming up out of the ground. But as I looked at it, I could, I could say that in my natural mind, time was very much involved here. Young, tender, middle of the period of time of harvest, this one was old. This one looked like it was nearing the end when it might be cut down and a new branch come forth, a new, a new uh, vine come forth and up the trellis. Each having a specifically appointed time. I do not understand when people start talking about the sovereignty of our God and want to know if God has any interest in the little things. Because all I saw here was a meticulous attention to detail for a purpose. God said that when he brought the Assyrians against Israel, he said, this is the same purpose that I have purposed throughout all the land. And he told uh, Solomon in the Ecclesiastes that there was a time for every purpose under heaven. Now how much more meticulous can our God be that there was a time for every purpose, it was the same purpose, and it was coming to pass in his appointed time. For everything there's a time. Everything there's a season. Everything there's a season. I looked at this vineyard and I thought to myself, you know, on the other side of the world right now, down in the South Americas, there's probably a vineyard just like this, full of grapes. The workers may be out there collecting the grapes and taking them off to the wineries or for whatever purpose they are. But there's a season. And at this time, looking at this vineyard with all the bare branches and everything, there was no season for the bringing forth of fruit. But there was a season appointed to it. This gentleman, this uh, husbandman, had spent the time preparing this plant for the season that would come upon it when it would bear fruit and manifest the life within. There is a vineyard down in South America someplace where that manifestation has taken place 
and the workers are busy there and the gentleman is preparing to make his product whatever it may be but there is no harvest in the season if there's no vine there's no preparation there's no care there's no love there's no fence in one of the towns in which I work there's an old blueberry patch the owners have abandoned it I don't know what has happened the trees have begun to grow in it the animals come in and eat freely oh I can tell there's blueberry bushes there there's fruit there but it's easily swallowed up it's easily taken away there's no love there's no attention there's no care for that field anymore Jesus said I am the true vine as I said I looked at these two vine vineyards and I couldn't tell you which was which but Jesus said I'm the true vine which means there is a false vine one of the things that we note from the scriptures is that when it comes to a comparative reference between that which is good and that which is evil we will find that the abundance of manifestation is in the evil broad is the way that leads unto destruction and many there be that find it there is a manifestation of excess we see the remnant as a tenth oh yeah it's an innumerable host that no man can number but it is a tenth of the mass we see that Lucifer's heart was raised up by the multitude of merchandise we see Babylon come down in the revelation because of the merchandise whereas or whereby the world has lived deliciously and sumptuously on abundance and gluttony yet when we look to the true vine we see a narrow way we see a straight way we see few there be that find it we find the footsteps of the flock we find that city set upon the hill we find two or three gathered together in his name their solitude their solitary existence there is no comparison whatsoever that would make someone desire to sit together with two and three by nature we are gregarious we want to be in crowds we want to be in the tribe we want to be in the the group we don't want to stand alone that's our nature in Adam and that is why there is such a consternation when it comes to the fact that I if I be a child of grace am a solitary figure coming out of that vine like that little branch those two little branches alone yeah we want to be with everybody else that's our nature after the flood they came together and they wanted to build a tower after the flood they wanted to make a name for themselves that's why God scattered them the Jerusalem church came together they had all things in common and God scattered them he keeps his people simple but they are an innumerable host and at the harvest he brings forth the fruit now I'm not looking at a harvest at the end of the year like the eschatologists want to say I looked at that vineyard and I thought to myself come this summer there's going to be fruit hanging there and the workers are going to be out here and they're going to harvest it and as soon as they're done harvesting it they're going to prepare for the next season of fruit bearing I don't think that there's going to be one time because Christ himself says you're going to bring forth fruit and he says the husbandman every branch in me that beareth fruit he purges it that it might bring forth more fruit does that mean that when the grapes appear he's out there cutting away so that the grape bunch gets bigger no it means when that fruit has been harvested he prunes the vine or the, the branches so that the next harvest brings forth more fruit which tells me that the time of our habitation if we be of the household of faith is a continual repetition 
of seasons in preparation and harvest. In preparation and harvest. In preparation and harvest. Until such time as the allotted fruit that we have been designated, appointed to bring forth, has been harvested. Whatever it is. When it has come to pass, he lovingly takes us away. Why? We have finished the work he gave us to do. Is this one of those things that we have to meet a tally? We have to fulfill our quota? If that bunch of grapes is connected to that branch, which is connected to that trunk, which is connected to that vine, which is connected to that root, there is no more fruit hanging on the vine, but what is the life in that root? You can't have more fruit than what life is in the root. You can't have less. We, we see in nature, you say, well, why did this bunch of grapes start right here and come down? Why? I don't know. Scientists can't tell you why. But one thing's for certain. There was an appointed place in which that bunch of grapes began to form and the exact number of grapes with their exact quality is on that bunch. Each child of grace as they are connected to the true vine, is appointed an exact fruit to bear. And they will bear that fruit in their season. And when that fruit is harvested, preparations are made for the next season. There's quietness now in those vineyards. Seemingly nothing is going on. But one thing's for sure, that life is still there. That love and that attention is still there. The anticipation of the harvest of grapes is there by the natural husbandman. How much more with an husbandman who knows the life within, because it, he is the life, how much more than he knows what fruit he has ordained should come to pass, you know, I'd think the man was crazy if I saw that husbandman down at the vineyard that I was viewing, standing there, shaking his finger, chiding the root, chiding the branch. Now you make sure you bring forth root for me. You behave now. You make sure that you constantly do these things so that you will be right and ready to bring forth fruit. He forced in his love that branch to come forth out of the ground or that vine grow up that trestle he didn't stop it down at the lower level it went all the way to the top and it, it looks strange as you see the top flat off nothing springing up in the air everything is orderly disciplined and precisely fastened at the needed intervals and the fruit comes forth do we praise the branch? I am the true vine. My Father is the one who tends to everything. He tends to it in His sovereignty because He alone has the right. As I noted as I viewed this vineyard, there was a fence there to keep me out. Oh yeah, I could have climbed over that fence and I could have found the gate or something like that. But to what end? I didn't know what to do in there. Anything I could have done would have been destructive and perhaps that man would have brought forth his firearm to chase me away from it. But the Heavenly Father from which each and every seed is born knows exactly what needs to be done. And only He has the right to do it. He has not let His vineyard out to another he has not asked someone else to see what they can do for him. He is the one who has the right as the sovereign God of the universe and as the loving Father to tend to that vineyard exactly as he has ordained it should be. Predestination, he planted the vine. 
for the purpose of bringing forth the grape. He intended the life to flow through the vine, through the grape, uh, through the branches, to the leaves, to the bunch, to bring forth that grape. There's attention to detail. There's attention to great detail. No one else can cause that life. He is the life. No one else can show that love. He is the love. So he is flowing in the vine, in the branches. What kind of fruit are we going to get? We go back to Isaiah and he says, I did all these things. Isaiah chapter 5. He says, I dug around it. I put a fence around it. I put a tower in it. And he says, I'm going to sing you this song. He said, he fenced it in, gathered out all the stones thereof, planted it with the vine of his choice, the choice is fine, built a tower in the midst of it, made a wine press there, and he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. Did it bring forth anything contrary to the root that he had planted? No, couldn't have. Can we get salt water from a clean fountain? Can we get oranges from a, from a peach tree? We know these things. Now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, men of Judah, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard, what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done? I looked at these vineyards. Do I dare lift my hand to try and help this master vine, uh, winemaker in his preparation of these? How much less preposterous is it that I should think that I'm going to lift up my hand, Adam, and aid God in what he has done. Assist him in what he has done. He, if I be a child of grace, has shed his blood for me. He has taken my sin, my inability to hit that mark, and he has removed it as far as the east is from the west. He has made it so that that account or that ledger of my sin would never be brought into consideration by the judge ever again. He was faithful. I have been justified by his faithfulness. He has established my going. He has set a path before me. He has assigned a labor for me, and he has prepared me, commensurate to that labor, to perform that labor. He has hedged in my way that I don't wander out here and out there. He's carefully tied me up to where I should go. He has put a light under my feet, and a light on my path. He has directed my steps. He has put a desire in me to delight in the things of God and the knowledge and realization that in Adam I can't do it and in Adam I don't desire it so that in everything that is done I will not glory before God or think of myself more highly than I ought. I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. If we have been born from above, if we are his people, <coughs> we abide in him. Because we can't live any place else. We can't dwell any place else. We don't need to invite him in. He does not st he's not standing at the door inviting himself in or hoping that we will open to him. If we are born of incorruptible seed, born from above, born of God, we are in him and he is in us. In us, if we be his children, in this earthen vessel dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Doesn't bring any praise to this vessel. Doesn't make this vessel any better. It shows that there's life within. If there is life within, fruit shall be brought forth. I can't see the fruit with nature. I can't see the fruit in Adam. Adam doesn't have the fruit. 
and bring forth wild grapes. Just like the nation of Israel brought forth wild grapes. Just like Adam shall bring forth those things that are of the earth. Because that's his nature. I am the vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, which means that it has finished bearing fruit, doesn't mean it's a renegade, doesn't mean it's rebellious. It means that every branch that is in me that has finished bearing his fruit, the Father comes and takes it away because the time of the habitation is over. The limitations have been met. The fruit which he has ordained should be brought forth has been brought forth. The harvest is completed. The time of their manifestation is over and he takes them away. There's no anger here. There's no uh, malice. There's no judgment. How can there be any judgment if we be in Christ? There is no condemnation to them that are in Christ. That's what uh, uh, Paul said in Romans chapter 8. And if we consider what he is saying here, Jesus says, If there is a branch in me that is finished bringing forth fruit, there cannot be judgment because therefore now there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. If I have the life within me, I have been born of the spirit. Have I the spirit of God? Yes. If I have the spirit of God, am I one of his? Yes. If I am one of his, shall I bring forth fruit? Yes. After Adam? No. But at the time when my habitation of this dwelling is over, my quota, and I don't use that as a thing that I should strive for, but to that which is ordained that I should bring forth, when that has finished, he takes this branch away. He doesn't destroy the fruit. Nothing happens to the fruit. He takes this branch away. There is no condemnation, so there is no judgment against these branches. He takes them away, preparing a place for another branch to be made manifest. Every branch that is in me that bears fruit, he purges it. He disciplines it. He sets his hand upon it. He ties it in its exact location. He prevents it from wandering out to the outskirts of the vineyard. Right? It, he ties it up into its exact location. If we be, and I keep saying if we be, because I don't like the presumptuous nature of saying, I am a child of grace. But if we be born from above, we are fitly framed together. We have a specific place in the building. We cannot take the place of the rim joist. We cannot take the place of the sill plate. If I am designated as a jack stud underneath of a door, that's where I am. That's my place. We are fitly framed together growing up to the holy habitation of our God. We have a place. We have a purpose. We have a designation. Here's the same thing. Each one of these branches has a specific place. It has a specific amount of life that is flowing through it, and that life will produce fruit. When the fruit bearing is over, the Father comes and takes it away, and then He comes and He clips and snips and ties, digs, mulches, whatever is necessary that the next branch should come forth and bring forth fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. It is the doctrine of Adam, blasphemous before God, to think that God comes and purges because I am sinful. He purges you and you are clean. That shed blood cleanses us 
from all unrighteousness. Is there unrighteousness in the seed? No. The unrighteousness is the fact that the seed became partaker of flesh and blood who was dead in trespasses and sin in Adam. His blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, as the Revelation tells us, they have washed their garments in the blood. We have been made clean by that blood. If we are clean, we are in the vine. We are not in the vine unclean. There's nothing unclean in that vine. You can't have the pollution. We have been cleaned, cleansed, excuse me, by the blood. We have been afore, prepared for the glory. And what is the glory? It's the glory of God. It's not the glory of us. It is the glory of thy people Israel. It is the church. It is the bride. It is his people. It is the peaceable fruits of righteousness. Now he has made us clean through the word which he has spoken. He has not come to judge us if we be his children. He has not come to bring down his wrath upon us. Why? Because the anointed one took the cup of the wrath of God and finished it. He drank it all the way down. There's nothing left. Just like there is no more wrath because he took all the wrath upon himself, there remains no more sacrifice because the sacrifice was commensurate to the wrath, the wrath was commensurate to the sin, all the sin was placed upon him, all the wrath was placed upon him, the sacrifice of his blood was complete, there remains no more sacrifice. He's not walking around picking up sticks, dipping them in his fountain filled with blood, and sticking them on the vine. It doesn't happen that way. There remains no more sacrifice for sin. There is no more blood. There is no fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. There has been once in the end of the world that he offered up the blood of the sacrifice. And when the Father saw the travail of the soul of his servant, he was satisfied. He didn't say, that's good for now, put some aside in case we have a problem down the street. He was satisfied because the sin of his people, the sin, complete, was laid upon him. And he cleansed us from all unrighteousness. Ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself. I can't do it. You can't do it. Adam tells me I can do it. Adam doesn't know what he's talking about. Adam wants to do it. Adam went right out into the tree, into the trees of the field, and he built himself an apron of fig leaves. Adam, Adam wants to say, sure, I can bear the fruit. Let me show you the works of my hand. Come see my zeal for Jehovah. That's what Jehu said. Come here, I'll show you how good I am. And do we have anything different? When they stood before him and said, Lord, Lord, did we not? This is Adam. This is Adam who wants to bring forth the fruits of his righteousness. And all the works of righteousness which we can do in Adam are as filthy, bloody, putrefying rags in the presence of God. And he who is of pure eyes than to behold iniquity does not even regard them because they have no place. But he says... The branch cannot bear fruit in itself. I didn't see any of the branches that had been cut by the vine dresser or the husbandman laying on the ground with bunches of grapes on them. I would have thought to myself, the man's a fool if he cut a bunch of grapes and threw it on the ground. That would be irresponsible. And I didn't see any of those branches squirming along trying to get a hole they can get back underground and Maybe pop up a new vine. Without the connection to that vine, that branch could do nothing. And that nothing is all inclusive. There is nothing that can be added to it. There is nothing that can be attributed to it. Well, all you have to do is believe. Without 
me you can do nothing without me Adam lies in the ground prostrate being formed from the dust of the earth but he can do nothing you can send all the preachers you want with all the literature and all the signs and wonders that they want the stigmatas the uh, auroras the shrouds of Turin, and all that other garbage and you can go to Adam lying in the uh, in the garden of Eden or no, the garden hadn't been made yet but lying there in the dust of the earth and do whatever you want Adam does nothing until such time as God breathes upon him and makes him a living soul so when Jesus said to, to his disciples if you abide in me you bring forth fruit no question about it there's no such thing as a bystander there's no such thing as a weaker brother or a stronger sister there is if you abide in me you bring forth fruit don't be looking for it after the natural eye you won't see it because it's the peaceable fruits of righteousness and Adam can't see righteousness but if you're in me you bear fruit you can't do it by yourself don't boast yourself because you chopped down the tree or you cut the piece of wood as we, I tried to speak last week shall the axe boast himself no the branch can do nothing for in him we live, we move, we have our very being in him we are the branch in him is the life that flows within us in him is the fruit that is coming forth which is the fruit of the spirit without him we prostrate on the ground and this branch quickly returns to the dust from where it's a king I am the vine you are the branches he that abides in me and I in him the same brings forth much fruit yes Lord we know that we know that very well and we thank you for that but we have come up with new technology whereby we may bring forth more fruit let us show you Lord why don't you sit down here let us show you what we can do we have Bible colleges seminaries we have all these books and, and self helps we have these wonderful conferences we fill up football stadiums with people and we know how to educate them to bring forth more fruit and he said fine go right ahead but the new covenant is they shall no more teach each other saying know you the Lord they shall be taught me yes Lord we know we know we, we, we need the leadership of the Holy Spirit here but I've got this wonderful book over here I've got this wonderful movie I've got these wonderful songs these singers have forsaken everything and, and they sing wonderful praises they can pre spread the word they can preach the gospel he says they shall all be taught of me nobody and I look back at those fingers no professor no our, uh, uh, agricultural genius could come in snatch a branch from that vine and say bring forth fruit no one can go in there and stroke the branch or play beautiful music for him or speak kind words to him as the fools want to tell us and have it bring forth more fruit there is an exact amount of it is a perfect amount it is a just amount for an unjust balance is an abomination before the Lord and more importantly or equally as important it is not esteemed of man because that which is highly esteemed of man is abomination before the Lord I looked at these two small vineyards no bigger than this house each one and I thought how many times I had been at this same location for continuing education seminars never paid attention to it but today there was a penny that I found and I didn't realize how much work there was until I walked down that path and saw the love and care that was set forth by the natural man and considered our father who is the husband then. Paul said I have found whatsoever state I am in therein to be content we could look at this vineyard and say those two little branches coming out of the ground were probably uh, anxiously waiting for the time when they could come to fruition and bring forth their fruit but they had to wait they had a time set for them 
they had a limitation set for them. And whereas over here we saw this big mighty vine and the multitude of branches coming off, ah, well established, very fruitful. We don't know what those two little branches should do. And they should do exactly what is assigned to them in nature by what comes out of that root. How much more is it for a child of grace to sit patiently during the time when there is no manifestation, to sit and wait the Father's hand, disciplining, pruning, until such time as the harvest comes. There will be a harvest. That's why the love is being shown. He doesn't do this to cover up the arbor with vines. There will be a fruit. It will be the fruit that he has decreed. And it will not be esteemed of man. You say, wow, that's a negative, isn't it? That which is highly esteemed of man is abomination before the Lord. And there's no abomination coming out of that root. There's no abomination in that vine. There's no abomination in that fruit. Therefore, that fruit will not be highly esteemed of men. I know that contrary to today's theological ideologies, let your light so shine is so that the world can see. The world doesn't like light. Why? Because man's deeds are dark. He hates the light. So who's going to see the light? Children of light will see the light. Who will see the fruit? The children. They will see the fruit. They will say, These, this is the fruit of righteousness. This is the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Here in his love, joy, peace, patience. Kind of so often we get drawn after Adam looking to see where can I see fruit I don't see any evidence I don't see any proof I don't see and you're absolutely right we're never going to see it in Adam there is a time when that torch as we spoke about makes an effect upon the pot but know well that that effect of that torch upon the pot was for the purpose of being breaking the pot it's not something that Adam likes oops I'm going to get broken Adam doesn't like the fact that there's a harvest coming because I'm getting pruned back Adam doesn't like the fact that when the time of my habitation is over, when I, when I have finished the time on the branch of that life throwing, flowing through me and the bringing forth of fruit, I'm being taken away. I don't like that kind of stuff. But Adam wants to see with my hands. Adam wants to come and say, see my works? See my zeal for the Lord? Lord, Lord, did we not cast out the demons in your name, heal the sick, preach the wonders of the kingdom? Didn't we do these things? What does the child of grace say? Lord, I don't remember ever seeing you that way. When did I do these things? Did it in the appropriate time? Did it to one of my beloved? We do bring forth fruit, brother. It's not a question of how do we bring forth fruit. It's not a question of should we bring forth fruit or if we bring forth fruit. The axiom is, if we are of the vine, we bring forth fruit. If the vine is of the earth, we bring forth fruit of the earth. If the vine is from above, then we bring forth fruit from above. We are frustrated very often, continually, because we can't see it. We can't prove it. We can't lay our hands on it. We can't say, ah, this is the proof. But the writer told us, these things have I written unto you that you might know that you have eternal life if you believe the Lord Jesus Christ. That belief is faith. That faith is an evidence of the Spirit. Don't expect Adam to see it. Don't expect Adam to rejoice in it. Because that life means death to Adam. Heavenly Father, I come before you to confess that after Adam we seek things for our satisfaction, for our enjoyment, and for our comfort. 
we get frustrated when we don't see these things and we are saddened as the natural mind of Adam convinces us that you have abandoned us or perhaps we are not of your fold we know Lord you have set these affections in Adam these limitations in Adam to show him to show us that we cannot glory in the flesh that we have no confidence in the flesh and that the flesh is completely antagonist to our existence in you we ask Lord if it be thy will that you reveal to us that peace that is beyond the understanding of Adam that you give us a moment of rest and peace that you quiet our hearts and our minds and give us to be still and know that you are God we thank you for the love for the patience for the care for the kindness and the gentleness wherewith you treat your vine and your branches we thank you Lord that you have not left this up to us to bring forth fruit to show our worth we thank you that you have not laid upon us the burden which we cannot do thank you that we if we be your children will bring forth that which you have ordained and it will be by your spirit and by your power and by your might we ask Lord that you would give us this patience to sit still to wait to watch as thy will is done in your name we pray. Amen.